So yeah, so today I'll be going over chapter 12 of Mastering Shiny. And this chapter is Tidy Evaluation. And the learning objectives for today are to learn the difference between a data, data variable and nth variable, and then create Shiny apps that let the user choose which variables will be fed into tidyverse functions like dplyr filter and ggplot aesthetics. Um, so tidy evaluation. Um, tidy evaluation is used through the tidyverse to make interactive data exploration more fluid, but it comes with a cost. Um, it's hard to refer to the it's hard to refer to variables indirectly and hence harder to program with. And in this chapter, we'll learn about how to wrap ggplot2 and dplyr functions in a shiny app and the techniques for wrapping um, these functions in functions in a package are a little different and covered in other resources, such as using, using ggplot2 in packages and programming with dplyr. Um, so first we just load the Shiny library, dplyr, and ggplot2. Um, so the motivation, so below you see, um, you'll see an app that allows us to filter a numeric variable to select rows that are greater than a threshold. Um, so you see here in like the UI, um, the select input is um, var, or rather from, we click, we create the number of variables, um, we assign it um, based on like different variables in the, um, from our data frame. And then with the UI, we select the variable, um, select the variable, call it variable, and the choices are based on what we've assigned to num vars. And then the numeric input is min, which would be the minimum and value starts at one. And then our output is a table. And yeah, so for the data, we're using diamonds and you're filtering it, um, the input variable, which again was um, these like carrot depth table price. Um, and you want it, the input, um, less than the input min and here the value is like one and then your output you get um, the head of the table and so here and again the minimum is supposed to be one but if you look at the table carrots it's all actually less than one rather than greater than one and this is a problem of indirection where normally using tidyverse functions you type the name of the variable directly into the function call but now you want to refer to it indirectly where the variable caret is stored inside another variable input var. Um, so we want to define like talking about the difference between um, these two variables where it's like you have an n, n variable, which is the environment environment variable, which is a programming, programming variable that you create with the assignment operator. So here input var is your n variable, and then you have a data variable which is your data frame variables. And it's a statistical variable that lives inside a data frame. So here, caret is our data variable. And so with these new terms, end variable and data variable, we can make the problem of indirection more clear because we have a data variable caret stored inside an end variable input var. And we need some way to call tell dplyr this. And there are two slightly different ways to do this depending on whether the function you're working with is data masking function or tidy selection function. So first we'll go to data masking. And, and by the way, I was having trouble like um, loading the Shiny app. So I'm just kind of gonna go through the notes and then there are apps that Hadley already has, so I can show those, but I wasn't able to run them on my own. Um, so data masking functions allow you to use variables in the current data frame without any extra syntax. And it's used in dplyr functions like arrange, filter, group by, mutate, and summarize, and in ggplots2 aesthetics. Um, data masking is useful because it lets you use data variables without any in additional syntax. Um, so this is a call to filter using a data variable um, caret and the envir an environmental variable minimum, where your minimum is set to one, and then within diamonds, you filter caret greater than the minimum of one. And then you get this tibble. Um, yeah, so here, here you see actually um, the difference between this one and the other one where before the 
all the numbers you saw for carrot were actually less than one, but here we actually get the response we wanted where the carrot is greater than the minimum of one. And then there's also the base R equivalent to it where it's diamonds and you're um, subsetting the diamonds, um, carrot from diamonds greater than your min, which is again one. And again, you see, get the same tibble. Um, and the base, chart, the base R function, base R functions refer to data, data variables with the dollar sign. And you often have to repeat the name of the data variable um, data frame multiple times, which makes it clear what is the data variable and what is the environmental variable. And it also makes it straightforward to use indirection because you can store the name of the data variable in an envi environment variable and then switch from the dollar sign to the double, um, double square brackets. And personally, I've never used the double square brackets. So if anyone has like a better idea how this works, but you feel free to chime in. But basically the difference between this line and then this line is that instead of using the dollar sign, here they use the um, double square brackets. And again, you, you get back the same, um, same output in your table. So then we can achieve the same result with tidy evaluation by somehow adding the dollar sign back into the picture while data masking using dot data or dot end to be explicit about whether you're talking about the data variable or the environmental variable. So here, um, here the difference between these ones, it's like, so you have dot, okay. So diamonds and you're piping in filter the data, carrot from the data, um, less than the environmental, um, using the environmental um, variable min. And then you can change that also by using the double square brackets instead of the dollar sign. So then putting this back into putting this back into like that original um, original shiny app that we did. So nothing changes in the UI itself, but within the server in data, here we um, here we, you see we use the dot data. Uh, the dot data um, double double square brackets input um, dollar sign variable and then that environment input min and then again rendering the table um, and now you have the app working where you see that carrot is actually the minimum actually is um, one and let's see I can switch to the app. I don't think you guys can actually see this one. Okay, let me stop sharing that and I'll share the other app. Uh, so this. So yeah, so unfortunately I wasn't able to get the other, um, I wasn't able to run the other one where it was messing up the min, but here you see like, so when I changed the min, um, you'll notice carrot is changing. So the minimum for this one is two, three, and you can go all the way up. And instead of having it, like if it was with the other one, rather than having them up greater than three, it'd probably be less than three. Um, but yeah, let me go back to the other. Let me do this one. Okay, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll just, again, showing you so it's this one. This is the the code for that same um, shiny app that I just showed. And if we go back to the original, where this was the code, where it's giving us like the min isn't. Um, it's not really respecting the min we're suggesting. Uh, info. Oh, thanks, Trevin. Yeah. So Trevin put some info about the dollar sign and double square brackets in the chat. Um, so subsetting. Thanks, Trevin. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so the difference between this one is where before we were just saying input the variable um, less than um, greater than input min. Yeah. And okay, so going back to this one. Okay, so that is that one. 
So now we'll do some um, example from ggplot2. So here we're um, applying this idea to a dynamic plot where we allow the user to create a scatter plot by selecting the variables that appear on the X and Y axis. Um, GeForce position auto was used to use so that GM point works regardless of whether the X and Y variables are continuous or discrete. Okay, so this one, yeah, selecting the X, X variable and from like the iris, um, iris data set and the Y and the output is a plot. Um, and then when we render plot, yeah, so in the aesthetics, you do dot data, double square brackets, input um, subset, subsetting X, and then for the lights, dot data, double square brackets, input um, subsetting the Y. And yeah, where they mentioned the GM, GG force vision auto. Uh, did I not put that picture? Oh, okay. Um, but alternatively, you could allow the user to pick the geom. Um, and then I think I don't have that picture. But yeah, um, the following app uses a switch statement to generate a reactive geom that is later added to the plot. So this one, let's see. So yeah, I think the fourth one where they're able to select the geom from like geom point, smooth or jitter. And, and then they add, yeah, they add a bit more information with the switch function. Okay, and this is the plot that you get. And let me open that one up. This. Okay, yeah, so using the iris data set, which is about like the flowers and the sepal length. So X variable, they will switch it to petal and then the Y variables length. But yeah, I don't think this is the one that switches the, they're all geom points for this one. But yeah, um, that's what that one did. Okay. And then, so one of the challenges of pro programming with user selected variables is that your code has to become more complicated to handle all the cases the user might generate. So like that's with like having to add the switch and all of that. And then, so we have another example with dplyr. And the same same techniques we use for ggplot2 works for dplyr. And the following app extends the previous simple example to allow you to choose a variable to filter, a minimum value to select, and a variable to sort by. So yeah, for inputs, you have the option to select a variable, the minimum variable, and a variable to sort by. Um, so yeah, the select variable based on the names the variables within empty cars um, and the sort by variable based on, again, the names of the variables based in empty cars. And then with your server function, yeah. And again, if anyone knows how to better explain this, <laughs> feel free. I'm, yeah, I'm still so new to Shiny. <laughs> um, yeah. And then for our output, we have the table, empty cars where it's filtering, um, dot data table, double square brackets, the input variable greater than the input min, and then arranging it, um, dot data, um, double square bracket input sort. And yeah, that's based on those inputs we have up here, their, their min and sort. And then let me open up that app. So yeah, so you can select a variable, we'll select displacement, um, and then uh, and they're sorted by, yeah, I did not try. Okay, 
So I think what's happening, so with the minimum, um, so I guess the minimum, the complete minimum value for displacement is the 71. And then as you choose a higher minimum, it's showing you less rows of the data. And right now it's sorted by MPG, but let's sort it by cylinder. Yeah. And then, yeah, so you'll see that um, whichever one you sort it by, it changes the um, which um, rows are shown first. Okay, let me go to the notes. Okay. And then, yeah, so that app allows you to pick a variable to threshold and how to sort the results. And again, you could see them live at this link. And most other problems can be solved by combining dot data with your existing programming skills. For example, what if you need to conditionally sort in either ascending or descending order? Um, I think the difference is that I want to say. Range. Yeah, I think they added that the if and else statement. That one. Okay, so then there's also user supplied data. Um, so we have here we'll have an app that allows the user to upload um, a TSV file and then select a variable and filter by it, and it'll work with the vast majority of inputs you might try it with, um, but however, if the data frame contains a variable called input, you'll get an error message because filter is attempting to evaluate um, DF input min. Um, so I actually, when I tried this app, I couldn't actually get it to work, like even from the website, but I'll try it again. Need to read these other ones. I'm not sure if that was the issue why I couldn't get it to run, but I put like a TSV on my desktop to try. Yeah, I keep getting this message disconnected from server. I'm not sure if anyone else tried the app to see if they could get it to run. Um, but yeah. Okay. And then, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the problem with getting um, an app to run is due to the ambiguity of data variables and environmental variables. And because data masking prefers to use data variables if both are available, and you can resolve that by using dot end to tell filter only looked for the min in the environmental variables. And you won't need to worry about this problem when you're, you only need to work, worry about this problem when you're working with user supplied data. But when you're working with your own data, you can just ensure that the names of the data variables don't clash with the names of the environmental variables. And in the book it said, if you do, you'll find out. <laughs> um, so then the question is like, why not just use base R? Um, and you might wonder, you might wonder if you're better off without filter, and if instead you should use the equivalent base R code here, um, data frame, data frame input variable greater than input min, um, and that's solely a legitimate position um, as long as you're aware of the work that filter does for you, so you can generate the equivalent base R code, which in that case you'll need to drop is equal to false if the data frame only contains a single column. Otherwise, you'll get a vector instead of a data frame, and you'll need to use which or similar to drop any missing values. And you can't do group-wise filtering, such as data frame um, piping group by or filter. Um, in general, if you're using dplyr for very simple cases, you might find it easier to use base R functions that don't use data masking. 
However, um, one of the advantages of the tidyverse is the careful thought has been applied to edge cases so that the functions work more consistently. And okay, so next we have tidy selection. So as well as data masking, there's one other important part of tidy evaluation, which is tidy selection. Um, tidy selection provides a concise way of selecting columns by position, name, or type, and it's used in dplyr select or in dplyr across, and in many other functions in tidyr, like pivot longer, pivot wider, separate, extract, and unite. Um, so in direction, so to refer to a variables indirectly, use any of and all of, both expect a character vector environment variable containing the names of data variables. Um, the only difference is what happens if you supply a variable the name that doesn't exist in the input. All of will throw an error, while any of will silently ignore it. So tidy selection and data masking. Working with multiple variables is trivial when you're working with a function that uses tidy selection because you can just pass a character vector of variable names into any of or all of. And wouldn't it be nice if you could do that in data masking functions as well? And that's the idea of across, the across function, um, which was added in dplyr 1.0.0. It allows you to use tidy selection inside data masking functions. Across is typically used with either one or two arguments. The first argument selects variables and is useful in functions like group by or distinct. Um, so yeah, I'm not actually familiar with like any of or all of. So again, feel free to chime in about um, any of the code you see. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone has any insight into this specific app, um, feel free to chime in. Uh, but I will, let me load that app, another. Okay. So yeah, I guess this one, you can use the specific variables. Um, oh, so like you can choose which variable variables to display. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone else had tried that. Um, let me stop sharing that and go back to the notes. Okay, and the second argument is a function or a list of functions that applies to each selected column. And that makes a good fit for mutate and summarize, where you typically want to transform each variable in some way. For example, following the code lets the user select any number of grouping variables and any number of variables to summarize their means. So that is all I have for our notes. There was another section of the chapter that I didn't go over, so I wasn't too familiar with it. So it's, um, sorry, so it's parse plus eval, and it said it's worth a brief comment but if you have no idea what the combination is, you can skip the section. Um, but if you use it, um, probably kind of shares a small note of caution. Um, so I don't know if anyone has used it, but I guess I'll just read from the book. Um, it's a tempting approach because it requires learning very few new ideas, but it has some major downsides because you're pacing strings together and, is very, and it's very easy to accidentally create invalid code or code that can be abused to do something that you didn't want. want. Um, it's not super important if it's a shiny app that only you are using, but it's a good habit to get into. Otherwise, it's very easy to accidentally create a security hole in an app that you might share more widely. Um, it'll be mentioned a bit more in chapter 22, uh, which is security. And you shouldn't feel bad if this is the only way you can figure out how to solve a problem, but we have a bit more mental space highly recommend spending some time figuring out how to do it without string manipulation and it helps you become a better R programmer. So in summary, in this chapter, we've learned how to create shiny apps that let the user choose the variables, which will be fed into tidyverse func functions, such as dplyr filter and the ggplot2 aesthetics. And it requires your, 
It requires getting your head around a key distinction that you haven't had to think about before, the difference between a data variable and an environmental variable. And uh, it'll take some practice before it comes second nature, but once you master the ideas, you can unlock the power to expose the data analysis powers of tidyverse to non-R users. Um, so this is the last chapter in the section, shiny in action part of the book. And I guess moving forward, we'll start with the, go on to mastering reactivity. Um, so which helps focus on improving your understanding of the theory that underlines shiny. Um, we have some comments in the chat. Oh, Lucio, you have, so you have used the parse plus eval, but it's kind of hacky. And yeah, Trevin hasn't used it. Like I've never heard of it before, but I'm, I'm so new to programming, but yeah. So I'll stop sharing there. I don't know if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I think Matthew said he was gonna start on chapter 13 today. Uh, well, perhaps not a question, but <clears throat> a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, what I asked you in the beginning of the of the meeting about if we require the use of the of such a special pipe operator instead mm -hmm. of just the, the base R1. Uh, well, I, I tried it uh, a little bit uh, earlier today, and yes, actually you, you can use the base R and still access a dot data. Uh, syntax in order to fix uh, this tidy, or in order to work with these tidy functions in our Shiny app, it, it, it still works also with base R operator, the pipe operator. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so I don't know, Matthew, if you want to take over and start um, with like chapter 13. And I think actually Lucio from last week, there was something, I forgot exactly what we're going over, but I think also you guys mentioned reviewing uh, something from last last week as well. Yeah, uh, Lucio, do you mind and you want to talk about uh, something from last week? No, okay, uh, well, let me share my screen. I will first, uh, let me, uh, okay, now, now yes, I share my screen. Uh, maybe I can show you also because uh, both of you, sorry, two of you mentioned that you were not familiar with the uh, with this parse eval syntax. I think it was over here. Uh, I don't know. I will show. I will just show you then. It, especially this that <coughs> uh, you can fit to our a, a string and make that R evaluate such a string as if it were like typical code that we would have written. For example, say something, uh, sorry, imagine something simple, like simply defining some variable X and printing its value. So we know what is the outcome of these two lines of code, right? Sorry, these two lines of code, X1 and X. And we can do the same if we define it. And we use the semicolon to create another line, but in the same one. Uh, next, and, and the opposite is the same. But now, if it is where a string, and say you want to evaluate this, then you can do this uh, kind of hacky thing. Uh, I'm pretty insecure as well. Uh, you do eval this, but this string you wrap it with parse so that there is a nice transformation of this text, sorry, of this string in order for a while to work. And now that I press enter, then we get the exact same output as we did over here, right? If I, if I simply will evaluate such code. So what the author is mentioning in that case uh, is that if you do something like, uh, uh, instead of using, and how do you say it? Instead of using the dot data syntax, if you instead, instead of that, you start uh, creating your whole, your whole, uh, let me show it with an example over here. And this is an example that I did for the Master in Shiny Solutions. But the idea is that you start with a simple uh, ggplot with plot, but depending on some of the inputs of the users, there was, additional arguments that could be added to this initial plot, right? Like 
not just a labels, but there were a couple arguments such as if you want to show a histogram or a density function and such. Uh, and this way of doing it, that I, this is the way I did it uh, that the automation that it introduces uh, security concerns is that your line of code is simply evaluated as a string, as we can see over here, but such code is created via concatenating various strings. In this case, this function would return something like uh, geom, something like this, geom, geom histogram with certain parameters, depending on, on what the user, on the user does. Uh, but this is one way to, to deal with what, um, what we just covered in the chapter using this eval part syntax to generate the code as a string and then simply evaluate it. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, it's not quite a good idea to do this. Uh, and maybe now I can share what uh, Matthew asked me to. And it's basically this application that a way for you to bookmark, uh, sorry, no, to download, to download the current state of your app, that is the actual, sorry, the current values of the inputs in your app, download such information via a JSON file. And then in your app, you can also upload such JSON file, and make, make it so that the app, now the inputs get updated uh, with the data that you have fed into it. I will just show the example because maybe it's not quite clear uh, if I only say it in words in words. So let, let me open it. It's really just uh, three inputs. This is later. We control how many random points we want for this histogram. Uh, and we choose a color for such histogram of, to the right. Uh, and what I say when I mentioned is that we can uh, save the values of these inputs, of this slider input, this select input, and in this case, this button is also an input. So I will press this, save current input values into JSON file. So I press Control J to look at this file that has just been downloaded. I will open it right now. And <clears throat> it basically is right. Uh, a JSON file. Let me change a little bit its structure for it to be easier to understand. Okay. And um, that it contains a. Uh, values of the inputs and what, what is the ID of such input. In this case, really, uh, this button has an ID of this one. R really, its ID is this one, but it still works like this. Then we had some slider. Its ID was sample size. And it's over here. And to the right, it's its current value once I press save current input values. And similar for the color. You, cho you chose one and its value was stored over here. Uh, and the main idea is that with these values, uh, with these current values, that is color Peru sample size 62, if I up upload such JSON file, uh, the values of these inputs will be set to what they are over here. Sample size to 62 and color to Peru. This other one, this in real, it really doesn't matter. So really color Peru sample size 62. Let me upload it. So I click in the upload button. I input this specific JSON file that I had just I have just downloaded. And now the inputs have been updated to what the values we had in the JSON file. So, Martin, do you want me to go a little bit more into the code, or? Um, I tried running the same code, the one you dropped on the Slack channel, uh, but I had a challenge with um, generating the uh, the JSON file because it's it gave me an error, and sadly, my laptop is currently not with me. I I moved. I kind of. I moved um, out of where I was staying, so I kind of left my charger somewhere. So um, I'll switch, get it soon. Um, is there a way you could? Yes. Okay. What are you trying uh, to do? 
Uh, then I will just explain, not the whole code, but really uh, the main parts of how this works, uh, how you can implement it. Uh, the main idea is that how does Shiny in the background update inputs in the page? Uh, well, in this discussion that Maya Gans and, uh, and Raj uh, had, uh, the link to this uh, part of the of the official code for Shiny, and uh, in this, for example, for this section that we are already familiar with, to update the uh, values of a text input, we get uh, this special syntax. The use of the session object that we have been working with when we define our server, this session over here. And in this case, uh, this specific uh, property of such session, uh, this is what is determined uh, via these parameters, that is to which ID using a specific uh, ID, sorry, to which input using a specific input ID. And in this case, what is the change that you want uh, to perform to such input? And if we can see over here, this message variable is, uh, let's not take a look at this drop nulls function. Uh, really the main idea is this list. You're passing a list of the values that you want to change, sorry, of the properties that you want to change and the actual values for such properties, right? For this text input, they're passing a list. They want to change the label, the value of such a text input or something like the placeholder for such input. So really the main idea is that you can also update, uh, perhaps in via this more generic way to update uh, uh, an input with via Shiny. You can also update your Shiny inputs directly via R, not necessarily uh, with, J with JavaScript, uh, using this similar syntax. In this case, this is the part that matters, this one over here. But the main idea is that, say, I want to update the color for this select input. Well, what is its ID, color? And the color, uh, what is it? Really, it's a selected value. So we could do something like uh, via this ID and the value and the selected value that we want for this select input. We could, if we wanted to update such input, instead of doing it uh, the usual way, like update select input, uh, you can do something like, let me just write it over here. Session uh, send input message. And then what is the input ID? For this select input, it's color. So the input ID is color. And then what do, we, what do we want to change? Well, we first put that into a list. We want to change a selected property. And say we want it to be Peru. So we write the property is selected. And in the value that we want for, for such property is Peru. So if you execute this, then the input with this ID will be updated, sorry, its parameter selected will be updated via this specific value. So really that's the main idea of this code. Uh, you press this button in order to, to get the current values of the inputs. Uh, and then when you upload the, but the JSON file downloaded, uh, really we are doing this over here. We have a list of IDs. So for each ID, sorry, for each ID, for each for each input ID, we want to change the value of such in, of such input uh, and set it to the value that it is stored in the JSON file that we have uploaded, right? The one that we saw over here. Because we have the what is the input ID and what is the value of such input ID. So it's really a, a play on this specific function. Uh, and, a, a little, and a little bit of, of JavaScript, that, but that's really isn't quite important. So are, are there any questions? Something you want me to perhaps cover in more detail or? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Lucia, maybe not for now, maybe some other time. Uh, we'll still ask some more questions. 
Um, sadly, like I said, my laptop is not here with me. Okay, you already dropped the code. Okay, a uh, link. Okay. Sadly, my laptop is not here with me, so I really will not be able to practice after now immediately. Most of the things you just um, explained. So, best thing is when I go through them, I would um, still ask uh, questions from you in the long run. Thank you okay. for doing this. They also try to, to run the code with the updated files because I just changed those in Slack like two hours ago. Okay. Okay, so um, chapter 13. Um, I think we have so much time to do that. And um, because of the, the challenge I had, because like I said, I had to move um, from where I was to my house. So um, next week, um, did, did anybody sign up for chapter 13? Um, anybody? No, I haven't. Okay, so um, I'll go through it and um, possibly I will take it um, next week. Oh, I think it's just the introduction part. I don't know why this is giving me a challenge. Tonight. I'm trying to use somebody else's laptop, but see if I can. Um, I still cannot access the um, the textbook. Um, hopefully, the next class we'll talk more. And um, I want to say thank you guys for coming around again today. I um I I hope we we'll keep doing this. I think before the end of May it should be done if we keep to the schedule now. I know there could be breaks. Uh, I just hope those breaks don't fall. Like there could be holidays. I just hope those holidays don't fall on our um, discussion days. So um, I want to say thank you guys for coming around, and um, I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Um, have a, a wonderful um, time. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hello, Trevin. Hi. Hello. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.